What's up? I'm back. This is part two of the most important people who ever lived. Number 30 is going to be Hannibal of Carthage. Interesting person, definitely symbolic. Um, a lot of people today study his work if you deal with warfare. There's some people who are studying his work because, you know, he battled Rome in very long wars. And if Carthage would have beat Rome, this might, Western society might end up have been very different, to be honest. Um, I'm not even going to say in general with him. See, the thing with this list is you don't have to, let's say, necessarily have heard about the person for them to influence you. You may not even have to, you may not even be aware of it at all. So, yeah, there's people who you can say may be more influential in terms of overtly, in terms of people, who, you know, military strategists who people know. But Hannibal is a very interesting character because when you start dealing with Carthage in North Africa, it's interesting because when you look at the war between Islam and the West, many people don't really realize sometimes, sometimes what we call politics, and it is politics, political and economic war, maybe religious ideology as well. But all those things are just mask for the real concept of, of war, in a sense, and the real motivating forces behind war. As all cultures, especially races, but you can say cultures too, usually originate from a Pacific landmass, you know, area. You know, if you're like Russian, you come from Russia. If you're Chinese, you come from China. No matter, you know, if you're British, you come from... United Kingdom, right? If you, in a sense, when you look at it, the land has like a personality itself. This is something that people don't really realize. And sometimes the political mask could just be something that a certain, a temporary form, if that makes any sense. So if you say Islam versus the West, yeah, you could talk about it as Islam versus Christianity, but it really is Northern Africa, Southern Arabia, or Arabia, let's say Arabia, Northern Africa, against whatever the case might be, Europe, if that makes any sense. And it's, the war comes when you start to cross different landmass. So if you were just in North Africa, if you were just in Italy or Britain, and you never went outside your territory, you wouldn't see this. But as communication, as transportation gets better, we clash, because we represent different areas of land. And sometimes it takes on different forms. So whether somebody might say, well, it's really Christian versus Islam, that's just a cover. Because Carthage wasn't really, obviously they weren't Muslim, per se, right? So then you say, well, if that's the case, then it's something else, if that makes any sense. So when you look at it, there are people who study Hannibal's work or how he was defeated. And in a sense, they think that that's how the West would eventually defeat Islam. But Hannibal, the thing about Hannibal and any and people like the Moors or North African cultures that I find fascinating is like when I write a, when I'm writing a book about his um, hip hop and Sufism. When you merge Africa and when you merge energies of Africa and energies of Arabia together, you do get a potent mix per se. So that mix is so lethal that and it's it's only if it's done right. Obviously, we're not talking about you know. Black people just giving their culture and become a Muslim. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when, when it's perfectly blended together. Yeah, you get a, a certain power. That certain power that certain power structures know will end them. So they make sure and study all that and study ways to how to override that. Hannibal, definitely symbolic of that, and no question he deserves to be number thirty. I'll probably put him higher if we go my personal bias, but I have to make this list unbiased as possible. So he'd be number thirty for me here. Next person is Pythagoras. Next up is Pythagoras. Uh, definitely influential. You know, the Pythagorean theorem, I can't give him that because many cultures had that before him. Even though he gets the credit for it, definitely many cultures discovered that before him. But I would give him... But, to be fair, in the West, since the West usually has problems admitting getting inspired by other people, they probably wouldn't even know about the theorem if it wasn't for him. To be honest. So I guess in a way it's a double-edged sword. You have to give him credit for him if you're looking at it from Western eyes, per se. But I'll give him credit when it comes to mathematics, the relationship between mathematics and music. He was really good at that. He understood that. 
it was it was even said that some of his followers even were healing wounds basically listening to, to different songs and in a sense when i think music the relation between music and spirituality is very underappreciated i think pythagoras definitely is a very very influent very influential because i think when you look at it from a certain perspective he put that on the map for the west and people still now don't even pay attention to it right and you know his ability to calculate he kind of knew that hey the earth wasn't the center of the universe he kind of knew that right he kind of knew in a sense like things that other people much later than him took for granted he knew before they did you have to give him credit for that you know he was obviously he was greek went to school in egypt interesting in the sense that you know when he went when he encountered the egyptians people like himself like people like him and other greeks would have to fast for days before the egyptian priest would even speak to them right so it's very interesting in a sense and they didn't get all the degrees of knowledge but they got a significant amount that they were able to influence greece and then greece was the starting point for the west really so definitely he's very influential everyone uses mathematics everyone should be you know he was really instrumental in numerology as well most people don't use number most people in the matrix don't use numerology per se that's more of an esoteric thing but numerology will probably get more famous in the future or more mainstream in the future for sure and even when you talk about ast astronomy and astrology that's still based on numbers so Pythagoras is definitely instrumental so he definitely deserves to be number 29 no question and um, other people's lists he'll probably be top 10 there's no question about that but when I make a list I try not to look at it as just from a western point of view and just from a 21st century point of view because a lot of people who a lot of if you look at a lot of lists in the west a lot of people who they support people don't really realize when you win wars you make history so the days of the west running the world is numbered and a lot of things that they get themselves credit for the the cultures to come wouldn't so when i make a list i try to make a list that stand the test of time if that makes any sense that's why I, the person who have number one on the list is going to shock people because most people don't even know who he is now and i'm saying he's number one most influential people person ever he <laughs> and most people don't even know who he is but that's going to come that's going that's in the future video right they, they, can, they can be part four now after pythagoras i got che Guevara. definitely personal favorite of mine i have him in the list because when you look revolution it doesn't get any better than Shea. You know, even when he had Fidel Castro as a partner, eventually he saw that Castro wasn't as even as revolutionary as he wanted. Shea was all about the revolution. He was very smart, very intelligent. He was a, he was a obviously so obviously he's a great warrior. He was also a doctor. I have an affinity for healers and doctors. That's the number one person on my list is actually a doctor, right? That's how you know it's gonna be. That's a clue to that person's identity. But I think being a warrior and a doctor, he understands human psychology, and I don't think you could be revolutionary if you don't. And we live in a world that capitalist is dominant, right? And the under, you know, the people who, the underachievers, the people who may have, you know, circumstances didn't give them an abundance of money or education. I think you always have to look at people like Shea because he was the defender of the poor or the needy or the uneducated. And no question, you know, throughout, throughout Latin America, his name is legendary. You know, you could have people who don't like him, who say he's a murderer. Or everyone who says he's a murderer. It's funny. Even so-called revolutions, libertarians. I once heard Alex Jones say, oh, you know, Shea is a murderer. Those people never have an answer when you ask them about the poor. About the needy. They don't, you know why? They don't care about them. And in capitalism, that class can actually get affected. Shea was their champion. So no question, because capitalism is a dominant economic system right now, I got to put Shea at number 28 for sure. I, my personal list, he'd probably be top five, but it's not personal. So next up, Queen Zinga. Uh, she's the queen of a Central African empire. Many people may not know who she is for the most part. she I have her as a symbol, a very strong woman, extremely strong woman. And I have her as a symbol because my prediction is going to be that, well, when you look at it, because I always have this list to stand up for the test of time, right? And when it comes to black folks in the disorder, they mainly come from West Africa and Central Africa. 
my prediction is though is that Central African kingdoms as the world gets more integrated and you could even say black people around the world get more integrated the Central African king, Central African territory is not kingdoms anymore but Central African territories in my opinion will be quicker outside of Ghana I'm not talking about, and then there's some West African spots that I'll say okay no they're on the list too but outside of Ghana I predict the Central African territories be more willing to embrace black from the disorder coming back home and Queen Zinger being from Central Africa and, and such a legendary queen and I think you know when it comes to a role of queens and this is not again this is not out of bias I, I don't you know for me I don't take stuff personal so I'm just looking at it as an observer you would have to say the greatest symbol of matriarchy on the planet is no question is Africa you know the African queens because see the, the thing is Many people would always talk about the kings, but the kings usually had, in Africa especially, advisors of women spiritualists, right? Because women were able to tap into the spiritual world better. So in a lot of ways, you didn't really need an identifiable queen, per se, because they were already running stuff from the shadows, which is how feminine power runs better anyway, in my opinion, right? It runs better from the background. And having a pawn, to be honest, on the sea. Um, queen Zinger was interesting because obviously she was no one's pawn. Right, she's a legendary woman, she's a researcher, I don't have time to go through all her accomplishments. But to me, she's definitely um, one of the two black women on the list, African women on the list. Um, she's definitely legendary, and many people don't know you know who she is. So I think you guys would be when you hear about her stuff she has done, pretty legendary. And you know, I think she was alive in the 15th century. Could be off a century or two. But off the top of my head, I think she was alive in the 15th century. Definitely deserves to be in the list and probably as the world goes on she people will probably find out who she is probably move her up even more on the list to be honest next up is a tie not actually people but cultures the bushmen or san or khoisan cultures of southern africa and also the pygmies these two tribes you could look at as you know whether the san people or, or the khoisan or the bushmen of africa and the pygmies some of the oldest human beings on the planet and Indigenous cultures where they're even, they're even distinct from other Africans. I think this is interesting in the sense because when you look at how indigenous people are treated around the world, many uneducated people wouldn't realize that Africans are different from even from each other. And in a sense, I find, like this is, I like this, these cultures here at 26 because it even goes into the problem I have sometimes. When, for me, a lot of people get into black consciousness as a reaction they're treated badly obviously no matter where they are in the world and they go back to it as a sense of i guess you could say to rejuvenate themselves to, to resurrect their own self-worth but i think when you do that only you come off as a reactive afrocentrist or pan-african and i think when it's reactive it's not it's never really as real as it's supposed to be so it's like almost like a fragment that you crew that you recreate but it's a fragment so it has a whole bunch of cracks there that anybody else looking at it can look at those cracks and exploit it and you know for me it's like if, if, if you would hear you would hear some people say oh you know you know the defense they'll talk about i have like pythagoras and people on this list i have some, some greeks and romans on the list right and they'll say oh well in africa you know the people didn't when you look at the gods like when you say the externalization of the gods like shango or whoever you want his name right dambala or whatever you want to name they would say oh they only thought those are principles when the greeks came in that got changed and the gods became external pieces and most of the time when when, when people were talking like this they even never been to africa or they, they could have been africa to be honest and they never really spoke to real bushmen or witch or medicine men and medicine women in africa if that makes any sense right so they're claiming oh well this is how it is because this is how it was because the Greeks and Romans changed it. But, nah. <laughs> they never really spoke to who they were supposed to speak in Africa, so that's why they feel that way, if that makes any sense. So then it comes off as a very... Cause, and, and, and again, many people go to Africa now, right? I, I even get Africans sometimes who don't, un, don't understand this. Nah, Africans knew that God's real. No question about it. Africans knew that there's a, a power in the land. And even when you had slavery and the slaves went to the Americas... South America, Central America, the Caribbean, it's connected to Africa. 
right? So African spirituality works just the same over there as it would in Africa. Like I, like I said before, you went to Russia with that, probably wouldn't work. But that type of knowledge is lost because, in essence, people are practicing a type of, pro of, of no reactionary African spirituality. And, you know, when you look at these two indigenous tribes, you can see where if they're distinct, even from other Africans, that separation was happening way before the European went to the continent of Africa. The European just made it worse, by per se. But that stuff was happening way before that. So, and with these two cultures, when you get into cultures that old, you don't really get into kings and queens as much, per se. Right? They kind of rule, especially the pygmies, because I'm much more familiar with the pygmies. Right? They rule from this kind of like joint collective rulership. And even when, like if you go to a pygmy tribe, even when they say, oh, this person's in charge, that's just the person who everyone else elected to say, oh, you deal with outsiders, if that makes any sense. And that's why pygmies in certain parts of Central Africa, they get discriminated against. So to me, that whole indigenous theme, right, even applies sometimes within Africa, to be honest. And of course, around the world, obviously it got worse, you know. Australians come into Australia, killed Aborigines, still killing the Aborigines now. Native Americans, almost totally wiped out. Eskimos of Canada, pushed back to isolated areas. Even indigenous people in some parts of Spain. If you go to Spain today, there's people, there's Spaniards who say, you oh, know, we're the indigenous person, people in Spain, and the other people are outsiders. That concept holds true almost anything you do, any area you go, right? And that comes from the fact that sometimes people don't really realize you have to honor the indigenous cultures no matter where you are. And these two tribes basically being the fathers of basically all Africa and then Africa being the father and mothers of everyone else. So these, these two tribes are like everyone else's grandparents in a sense. And, you know, you even go to some parts of the Philippines, you, see, you still see pygmies today. You know, and, and sometimes even when you had in Egypt, when you had the pharaohs, they used to have, like the god Bess, used to be depicted as short. And sometimes, you know, those pygmies or people like that used to be advisors to pharaohs because they were thought to be more in tune with nature. So I definitely think these two true groups supposed to should be up here for sure, very influential. And I think even though they're small in number, when certain changes happen in the world, a lot of those people know how to live off the land. They'll probably be amongst the people who survive them. So I got to give these people their credit for, no, for sure. Number 26, without question, eventually they'll right, they keep going up. Um, Saladin of Syria, number 25, per se. Uh, influential person, for sure. You know, even in Europe, when Europe hated Muslims, he'd be one of, with the one name that you hear about. You know, from being in Syria, he got a lot of financial back in Egypt. So he conquered Egypt, he took Syria, even took Mesopotamia. So you're talking about a person who, then he eventually conquered some parts, some parts of Jerusalem. So you're talking about a person who could, if you, look, if, you, if you add up Egypt, Mesopotamia, Syria, Jerusalem, I mean, that's the cradle of civilization. No question about it. Very influential person, for sure. I think, um, I mean, other than Africans, Muslims definitely influenced the world or, or cultures from what we call Arabia and North Africa today, right? Because obviously the culture is older than Islam. So Saladin definitely deserves to be on the list, number 25 for sure. He's a name that, you know, a lot of people don't really discuss too much, right? But I, I mean, he's no question influential. And I think as, again, as civilization keeps going, he will keep growing up in, in terms of in people's rankings. Number 24, I got Yellow Emperor. Definitely influential. Some people attribute him to creating Chinese culture. In Chinese culture, he eventually was known as he took, when he ascended, he took his whole court with him, his wives, his court. He ruled with like three or four women. And when they all ascended together, you know, <laughs> these days that sounds like a doomsday cult. But for China, that they hold that that really happened. So his influence is immeasurable. You know, he was, he made a lot of, um, a lot of, he had a, like a lot of, a whole system of enhanced sexual, spiritual alchemy, sexual alchemy, stuff like that. So, no question when it comes to he laid the groundwork for early Taoism. Even when Lao Tse created Taoism, a lot of it was actually off Yellow Emperor's work. Lao Tse just made it easier to understand. And he did it with three or four women, which showed the matriarchal origins of China. 
So he definitely is influential. And I like what I like about him is that he took his whole court with him. I mean, I haven't heard any spiritual master, even in the Bible, the, the Quran, that, 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 that did that. So 24, Yellow Emperor, definitely one of my favorites. Definitely deserves to be there. And I would say at, at 24, after him, it would be Buddha. Obviously, Buddha is a person who, depending where you are, he could be number one on the list. Do I have to go too much on Buddha? Not really. He was Indian. He didn't like the way Hinduism, he didn't like the direction Hinduism was going. He created his own system. What I like about Buddha was that obviously, obviously he, you know, in most Oriental countries, predominantly Buddhists. Even countries that have a lot of Indian populations. I think Muslim, Islam took over. But before Islam, Buddhism was a way, because Buddhism doesn't have a caste system per se. It was seen as a reform type of Hinduism. And because so much of the world is influenced by that, I mean, Buddha, there's no question. I mean, Buddha, I mean, he, he think of it. I mean, he kind of got enlightenment just off meditation. I don't think you could do that today. But at the same time, it shows how important meditation was. And his influence is great. And he was a prince who did it. He, he, did, he was a person who didn't have to do it. He wasn't poor. He decided to go out there and dedicate his life to spirituality and to helping others. I mean, and his, his, his influence is so much, I don't think there's anyone on the planet who doesn't know him. Any race, any background, everyone knows Buddha. So can he be number one on this list? For sure he could. He's number 23. To me, it shows the depth of my list. For some, it may be <laughs> the, the accuracy of my list. Who knows? But Buddha definitely deserves to be 23. Definitely deserves to be on the list. Next up, Alexander the Great. What do I got to say about him? I mean, he's a legendary conqueror. And he was a warrior. And he was kind of a priest in the sense that he was a, a student of occultism. So there's no question when you look at how the world, the shape of the world, or how the world, you know, the path the world took, no question is Alexander definitely part of that. He was definitely <laughs> the reason why it happened like that, No, for, for sure. Now, whether you consider that good or bad, that's open to debate. I mean, many people want to go into his personality flaws, but I just, I just go into the man in terms of what he did. You know, if you're into, I mean, he was a person who, he was more open-minded than a lot of his soldiers and a lot of the Greeks at the time. And he, he has to be given props for that. Whether you... You know, people get, want to get into sexuality, stuff like that. That's a whole other talk topic. That's that's Greek culture. I'm not even saying that's good or bad. That's just what they did. I don't judge. It's not my place to judge. All I can look at is his point in history, his role in history, his place in history. And he's definitely, to me, top three conquerors easily. All right. Um, next up, Gandhi. Not much to say. He got the Brits out there without having to th fight a war. None needs to be said about that. I mean, when it comes to nonviolence, probably the best name of the list, Gandhi. King studied a lot of Gandhi's work, so even Dr. King probably wouldn't even have had some of the viewpoints he had if not for Gandhi. So Gandhi definitely deserved to be in the list, so much so that I don't know if he's as famous as Buddha. I don't think he's as famous as Buddha, but most people kind of know who Gandhi is. So when you talk about influential, that's how you know what's influential. No question about that. So... Tomorrow, I'm going to have part three. Hope you enjoyed this segment. Till next time, peace.